Hey guys, my name is Ahizix and you are welcome to a brand new series on React Hooks. So in the first introductory lecture, we are going to cover the what and why of React Hooks. And in the upcoming lectures, we are going to discuss the use state hook, use effect, use contest, use reducer, and a lot more. Alright, so I will be going over every single hook that is built into the core of React. Don't worry, if you are a newbie, I would take my time to carefully and simply explain the concept so that everyone understand it well enough. To proceed, do all well to hit the like button, make sure to subscribe and let's get started. What exactly is hooks and why is it important to learn it? Alright, so what actually necessitated hooks? Before we proceed, I want to be sure that you already know the basic concept of React.js and you are familiar with topics like functional components, props, states, maps, control input, and so on. However, if you are a newbie, I highly suggest you go through my React.js 101 course for beginners in order to get yourself equipped with the basic concept of React and then come back to Hooks and continue with us. And now let's begin. What exactly is Hook in React.js? Hooks are new feature addition in React System 0.8 which enables us to make use of state and lifecycle features without writing a class. Alright, so it implies that we will be able to hook into React state and make use of all the state features in functional components. As a matter of fact, using React hooks, you can achieve exactly the same result you had using the lifecycle method. And you can do that with lesser code. Take notes. React hooks works only with functional components. And now the question is, what necessitated hooks and why is it important to learn hooks? Point number one. Earlier on, when React was created, to work with classes, you have to clearly understand this keyword in JavaScript. And if you are familiar with JavaScript, you will know that this in JavaScript doesn't work exactly like in other languages. However, when it comes to React hooks, you don't have to worry about this keyword. You know why? It is simply because we won't use it anymore. Sounds good? Beautiful. Point number two. You will always have to bind event in class component. But with the introduction of hooks in functional component, no more method binding. And that is of course a huge relief. Point number three. Classes makes hot reloading very unreliable. Simply because they do not minify very well. Alright, so classes makes hot reloading very flaky. Point number four. Hooks makes it possible to shell stateful logic between components without changing your component hierarchy. Take note of these key points. You cannot use hooks inside of a class component. Hooks only works in functional components. Alright, so hooks can only be used in functional component. They are ineffective inside the class component. Note number two. Hooks do not contain any breaking changes and their release is backward compatible. In summary, hooks are special function that allows us to hook into React states and lifecycle features from functional components. For example, the use that hook is a hook that enables you to add React state to functional components. 
Hooks allows you to hook into React Futures without writing a class. With the use of hooks, you don't have to worry about this keyword anymore. And finally, it allows us to reuse stateful logic. Now we have clear knowledge of what React Hooks is all about. Let's practicalize it in the next lecture. This is all for now. Do well to subscribe and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. Let's proceed with the used hooks by practicalizing it. Quickly create a new React application and give it a descriptive name. For example, you may decide to call it Hooks Practice. At my end, I have it created already. So, let's continue. Head on to VS Code. Open up the Explorer. Client. Right within the SRC, we are going to create the components directory. Right within the component, we are going to create a new file called counter.js. Generate the functional component. Perfect. All right, so let's talk about the usedate hooks. The usedate hook is a special function that takes the initial state as an argument and then returns an array of two entries. The first element in the array is used to store the initial state. And the second element in the array is a setter function which accepts the argument that is used to update the initial state. Let's implement it quickly so as to have a clear knowledge of what I'm talking about. To proceed, first, we have to import the usedat hook at the top. Come here, place a comma right here, open and close curly bracket, and I'm going to do usedat, just like this. Okay, the usedat hook is a special function, right? So we have to invoke it. Like this. This function takes in initial state as an argument. And in this example, the initial state is going to be zero, which then will return an array of two entries. Const array. So we are going to have count, comma, set count. Assign it like this. This syntax over here is called array destructuring. It is a feature of ES6. So right here, the first element in this array is a variable that is used to store the initial state. So the second element is a setter function which accepts an argument that is used to update the initial state. It's as simple as that. Take note, the initial state could be a number, boolean, string, or an array. Okay, so all of them can go in here within this parameter. Let's quickly display the count on the browser. So right within the JSS, let's use a H1 tag to display the count. Open and close curly bracket, and then we are gonna reference the initial state, which is the count that holds this guy. It's as simple as that. Save, make sure to run your application on the terminal. So before we proceed to the browser, we have to render this component in the app.js. So right here, we have to select from the opening header tag to the closing header tag. And right at the top, we are gonna import counts from dot slash component slash count. So let's render count over here. It's as simple as that. And again, make sure to run the application, save on the browser, and boom. Can you see? Here is the initial state of the counter application. So let's make it more beautiful right now. 
I'm going to do. And here is it. Perfect. So the intention of this lecture is to change the initial state of our counter application when the button is clicked. So for that, we have to specify a button. Right within the button, we are going to specify the on click. On click of this button, we are going to invoke the setter function. So right here, I'm going to do set count. And then the setter function will take in an argument that will be used to update the initial state. And in this case, the argument is going to be the initial state plus the new value of the state. Let me drag this down. All right. And this is a function call. We have to convert it to our function. Just like this. Save on the browser and boom. Let's give it a try by clicking the change button. Can you see that? Perfect. This exactly is what the intention is. So to recap, if you want to make use of the state and react JS, first, you have to import the usedState hook at the top. And after that, you have to invoke the usedState hook and then pass in the initial state as an argument. So having done that, you have to assign it to an array of two entries. And right within this array, we have the first element to be a variable that is used to store the initial state. And the second element is a setter function which accepts an argument that is used to update the initial state. And in this case, the argument over here is the initial state plus one. All right. So for the first time, the component renders a state variable is created and initialized to zero. So now when you click on the button, the set count method will be invoked, which then will increment the current count by one. So invoking the set count method will cause the component to re-render. And after that, count will contain the current value, which then is displayed on the browser. So it's as simple as that. There are two important rules to be considered when using React hooks. Rule number one, hooks can only be called at the top level. So do not call hooks inside of a loop, condition, or nested functions. Rule number two, hooks can only be called inside the React function. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to set state based on the previous state value. And also, we will discuss the difference between this example and the previous example we did. So here in this lecture, we are going to demonstrate how to increment, decrement, and even reset the counter. So let's quickly do that. Within the components directory, we are going to create a new component called counter2.js. Generate the functional component. So let's quickly import the usedStat hook. It is a function. We have to invoke it and then take in the initial state as an argument. And in this case, the initial state is going to be zero as usual. And this returns an array of two entries. Right, so I'm going to do const an array here. We're going to have count. And then we have the setter function to update the initial state. Assign it like this. Simplified. All right. So having done that, let's quickly move on to the JSS. Let's use the hedron tag to display the count. Having done this, we have to implement the buttons. First, we are going to have here increment. Let's duplicate it three times. 
here we are going to have decrement and here we are going to have reset just like this let's specify the on click taking an arrow function we are going to invoke the set count and then pass in the initial count plus the new value same thing here so i'm just going to copy come here paste so the difference is that this is going to be subtraction for the reset we have to declare a variable const initial count equal zero so on click of this button we want to reset the count all right so i'm going to do something like this right now let's just wrap it up in a div move it in let's quickly format the code perfect see whenever you format the code you are going to get proper indentation and here let's specify the on click so we have to set counts to initial counts okay so having done this open up the app and here we have to import counter2 from component slash counter2 and we have to render it right here save the application let's place a comment on the count which is the previous example check it out on the browser can you see so let's give it a try by clicking the increment button oh beautiful okay decrement increment increment decrement reset everything is working perfectly fine as expected so the intention of this lecture is to update the state based on the previous state value so go back to counter 2 we are going to demonstrate this example with the increment button and after that you can go ahead to implement it on the rest of the buttons so on click of this button we are going to call a function increment and this function would be defined at the top we're going to have const increment set it to our function and then right here we're going to set count to count plus one save on the browser and everything still works perfectly fine as expected all right so let's go straight to what the problem is now so let's assume within this function we want to increment count by two so it is easier to do something like this we just have to duplicate this and then have it like this when you save on the browser refresh click on the increment button can you see everything is incrementing by one but look we were expecting this application to be incremented by two but now on the browser we have it incremented by one it seems it's not working out fine so that is one of the drawback when using counts plus one in react JS. so let me explain it well enough when you look at this closely you will realize that we are updating the same state multiple times as a result react will aggregate all of this state into a single batch and execute them once so even if we do this million times let me show you like this save this also will be incremented by one so react will aggregate all of this state into a single batch and execute them once so you may not see the effect of what you did over here because this is even supposed to be incremented by let me see one two three four five six so this is supposed to be incremented by six but look it increments by one so this is the drawback of using count plus one in react and now the question is why do react update state in badges don't worry I will give you the answer to this question towards the ending of this lecture. So let's quickly solve this problem. To resolve this issue, we have to pass an anonymous function that has access to the previous state value. And now the syntax will look 
different. Set count. So right within this function, we are going to do previous count, set it to our function. And then we are going to have here previous count plus one. Okay. Highlight, duplicate it. So when you do this and check out the browser, reload, hit the increment button and you see it is incremented by two. It's as simple as that. Do you see that? Now the application is working as expected. Trust me, it is indeed working as expected. So here we passed a function that has access to the previous state value and we incremented it by one. So we can as well increment it by five. Let me show you. Duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. Save. On the browser, we have to reload. Increment by five. It's as simple as that. Okay, so take for example, you want to increment all of these stuffs by 10. So you are going to have a repetition of code like this. I don't like that. So let's perform uh, some little iteration over here. Now I'm going to do for let i equal 0, i is less than 2, and then i plus plus, like this. So here we're going to have the set count function. So right within, we are going to gain access to the previous state value. And then the previous state value plus one. Save. On the browser, refresh. Hit on the increment. Can you see? It is incremented by two. When you come here, you do five. Save. On the browser, refresh. It is incremented by five. So this brings us back to the question, why do React update state in badges? Let me give you an answer. The reason why React update state in badges is simply because in React.js, whenever the state gets updated, the component will re-render. So let's imagine we have this updated thousand times. It simply means our component is going to re-render thousand times. And that would deeply affect the performance of the application. So React gave it a thought and decided to update their state in badges. So it is going to aggregate all of those occurrences and execute them once. Okay, so I understand that this lecture is quite tricky, but I highly suggest you play the video over and over again to get it stick to your memory. This is all for now. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In this lecture, we are going to understand how object works with the used state hooks. Alright, so let's get started. Within the components directory, we are going to create a new counter. And I'm going to call it counter3.js. Generate the functional component. Close down the explorer. So quickly, let's import the use state hooks. Let's declare the necessary state variables to be used. So here we are going to have const an array, and right within this array, we are going to have employee comma set employee equal you state and write in this example, the initial state is going to be an object. Right within this object, we're going to have name, colon, set it to empty string, comma. We're going to have country, colon, set it to an empty string as well. All right. So the initial state over here is quite different from the previous lectures. So dealing with the object in you state hook will involve a new approach. It's quite simple, so I don't want to scare you out. Right over here, let's wipe this off. So within the div, we are going to have an input tag and the type equal test. The value, we have to display the value dynamically, employee dot name. Okay, so this input is going to be used for the name. And on change, so if the user begin to type into the input field, 
right here we're going to get access to the event set it to our function and then we will invoke the set employee method of course you should know by now that this will accept an argument that will be used to update the initial state it's as simple as that so right within the parentheses we are going to take in an object then i'm going to do name like this e dot target dot value beautiful let's close down the input tag okay let's quickly format the code better highlights from line 7 to line 11 duplicate it so here it's going to be employee dot country so the next in line is to display the employee's name and country on the browser and um we're going to have a div right within the div let's have a p tag and right within the p tag i'm going to do my name is employee dot name highlight and duplicate is going to be employee dot country so here i'm just going to do i am from employee dot country so whatever country you are typing in into the input field is going to appear here all right so save open up the app js yes we have to render it over here and i'm going to do import counter three from component slash counter three place a comment on counter two and then we have to render counter three dot js close it up with the soft closing tag save on the browser boom perfect so let's type in something into the name field so the name is edubaba everything is working for the name so when we begin to type in into the country field we are going to experience a weird behavior country is going to be uk can you see when you type in into the input field the name over here will disappear and when you begin to type in into the name field the country over here is going to disappear so watch it closely do you see now so also when you begin to type into the country input field the name is going to wipe off all right so let me quickly bring it to your notice okay let's do it right here let's have another div and right within this div we are going to have a p tag and right within the p tag i'm going to do json dot stringify and then we have to reference the employee save on the browser and boom can you see now we have the name and we have the country so when we type in into the input field of name it is going to appear here in between this string and when we type into the country it is going to appear here in between this string as well check it out so the name is going to be edubaba when i type in into the country field can you see the name disappears and the country stays so this happens simply because the use that hook does not automatically merge an update object unlike the set state method that is found in the class component so the solution to this problem is to use the spread operator to manually merge and update the object let me show you quickly it's extremely simple so right here we have to spread the employee like this okay and here also we have to spread the employee so this will help to manually merge and update the object as simple as that when you save all right let's give it a try you baba and you baba appears here the country uk and the uk appears here everything is working perfectly fine as expected so in conclusion whenever you are dealing with object as a state variable you have to make use of the spread operator to manually merge and update the object
This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to use array as a state variable. So, right within the components directory, quickly create a new file called hook state array. Right click, new file, hook state array.js, rfc to generate the functional component. Close down the explorer. Let's quickly declare the state variables to be used. But before we proceed, first, we have to import the usedState hook at the top level. Place a comma right here. Open and close curly braces. usedState. And now let's declare the state variable. Items. We have to set items. And the initial state is going to be an empty array. Okay, so the intention of this lecture is to add items into this array. Okay, so the items we are going to add into this array is going to come from the input field. So therefore, we have to declare the state variables for the input field. So let's imagine we want to add the names of employees into this array. And I'm going to do here, employee, comma, set employee, equal use state. And the initial state is going to be an empty string. So whatever we have here will be added into this array. And the question is, how can we do that? Don't worry, I'm going to show you in a GFE. Let's quickly move on to the UI. Highlight this, wipe it off. Now let's have a H2 tag, and I'm going to do add employee. Right below, we're going to have an input tag. Close it up with the self-closing tag, and then the type is going to be test value we are going to take in this guy right here which is this variable that is going to hold the initial state just quickly copy and paste it here so when the user begin to type in into the input field we have to grab those values that they are typing in so for that we have to specify the on change right here we are going to take in the arrow function so right within the arrow function we have to invoke the set employees setter function. So having done this, the arrow function over here is going to give us access to the event. And with the help of this event, we will be able to target and grab the value that the user is typing in. Event dot target dot value. It's as simple as that. So the intention is to add items into this array on button click. So let's quickly specify the button. Button. And right within this button, I'm going to do add items. Within the button, we have to specify the on click. So on click of this button, we are going to invoke the add items function. Let's quickly define this function. Come to the top. So we are going to have const add items, set it to our function. So right within this function, we are going to invoke this setter function over here. Set items. So let's quickly pass in the value set for the item array. And in the previous lecture, we learned that the setter function do not have the capacity to merge an update. Or in the case of array, we can say that the setter function cannot append item to the end of the list. Therefore, we need to handle it manually with the help of spread operator. Let me show you quickly. Alright, so to set the item, we are going to have 
an array and then spread the item array. So lastly, we are going to push a new object. It's as simple as that. And right within this new object, we have to specify the ID items dot length because we want an ID that will be used to uniquely identify the items that will be added into the array. Name employee. So over here, right within this object, you can add as much as data as you want. So for example, if I want to add employee's address, you just have to duplicate the state variable and specify the variables and the setter function. Then come here, comma, you can add it below. It's as simple as that. Having done this, let's quickly map through these items. Let's do it right below the button. I want to use the UL tag and right within the UL tag, we are going to have the curly braces and then items dot map. Within the map method, we are going to take in an R function and then open and close parentheses. Right within the R function, we are going to pass in a parameter item and this parameter represent each item in the list okay and then here we have to display it on the screen and i'm going to do li i want to use the li tag let's specify the key to be item dot id and right within the inner html we are going to have item dot name which is this name over here the id and the name Let's render this component right within the app.js. We have to import hookstate array from component slash hookstate array. Place a comment on this. Come here. Render hookstate array. Save on the browser. And boom. Beautiful. Let's check it out. So here I'm going to key in Edubaba as the first employee. When I hit on the button, it get added. We're going to have Daisy. Boom. Mike. Okay, so we're going to have Amaka. Friends, this name over here is dear to my heart. <laughs> All right, everything is working perfectly fine as expected. Teaching good? Beautiful. Go back to VS Code and let me explain what happens under the hood. Okay, so something is going on here and I have to explain it simply so that everyone understand it well enough. Let's move on to the function. Before we proceed, let's quickly format the code. Perfect. It looks clean and I love it. Okay, so when the add item function is called, this setter function will get fire up. So we make a copy of all the items in the array using the spread operator. To the list of copied item, we then append a new object. And by so doing, we are not overwriting the original array. This will actually append it to the end of the list. So in summary, when working with array as a state variable, First, you have to make a copy of the items using the spread operator. And having done that, you have to append a new item and pass it as an argument to the setter function. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. Welcome back everyone. So in this lecture, we are going to organize the folder structure. Open up the explorer. Right within the components directory, we are going to create a new directory called usestate practice. So now we are going to copy all the files that is related to the usestate hooks into the usestate practice folder. Hold down the command key on your keyboard. Tap to select the related files. 
drag and drop it into the use state practice. Click on move. Perfect. So now we have the components directory and right within the component directory, we have the use state practice, which contains all the files that are related to the use state hooks because we are going to practice so many hooks in this course. So it is good we organize our folder structure. Now the problem here is that the import will be missing. Close down the explorer and then let's see what happens right in the terminal. Can you see? We are having problem with the import. Can you see? All right, let's resolve it quickly. Go back to the app component because here is where we have almost all the imports. So let's quickly take off all of these stuffs and then let's do it from scratch like this. Import counter from dot slash component slash use that practice slash counter. So you can do the rest at your end. Done with it. All right. So when you check out the browser, everything is working perfectly fine as expected. So in the next lecture, we will begin to practice the use effect hooks. This is all for now and catch you in the next lecture. The use effect is a hook for encapsulating code that has to do with side effects. And it is a combination of component did mount, component did update, and component will unmount. Previously, functional component don't have access to the component lifecycle. But with use effect hook, you can tap into the lifecycle features. Therefore, we can say that the use effect hooks allows you to perform side effects in your components. Some example of side effects includes fetching data, directly updating the DOM and timers. In simplicity, the use effect syntax will look like this. If you want to make use of the use effect, first, you have to import it at the top. The use effect is a function, therefore, we have to invoke it. And here exactly is where the fun begins. So right now, I want you to fold your hands and pay attention to my explanation. And please do not join me in typing code. So the use effect is a function, right? And here we invoked the function. The use effect function takes in two parameters. The first parameter is a function that gets executed after every render. All right, which simply implies every time the component renders, the function will get called. So the first parameter of the use effect is a function that gets called after every render. Okay, so this guy right here. Okay, let me put it together so that you can get the gist. This is the first parameter of the use effect, which is a function that gets executed after every render. And the second parameter is an empty array, which is widely called the dependency array. So for that, we just have to place a comma right here and then take in an empty array. So this is the first parameter of the use effect. And then this is the second parameter of the use effect. This guy right here gets fired up after every render. So this is called the effect. This function right within the use effect hook is called effect. When an empty dependency array is passed as the second argument to the use effect hook, it simply means the use effect will run only on the first render. So whenever the component re-renders, the use effect is not going to run. That exactly is the use of the empty dependency array. Another important point is that you can also condition effects using the props or state value. 
and you do that by passing it right within this array. Don't worry, in the next lecture, when we begin the implementations, you will definitely understand it well enough. Alright, so this is just a glimpse of what the use effect is. Another important point that I want you to take note of is that the use effect is defined inside the component. And by so doing, we will be able to get access to the state and props without having to write additional code. So let's quickly format this code and have it look better. Perfect. So to recap, before you make use of the use effect, first, you have to import it at the top level. The use effect is a function, yeah? So we have to invoke it over here. And having done that, the use effect accepts two parameters. The first parameter is an arrow function, which in this case, the effect. And the second parameter is an empty array. So having understood all this, we can boldly say that the second argument helps to conditionally run effect. Let's practicalize it in the next lecture. See you then. In this example, we are going to build a very simple application that updates the document title when the button is clicked. So, we are going to mimic the component did mount and the component did update. Quickly within the component directory, let's create a new package called use effect practice. Command B to open up the explorer. Right click on component, new folder. Right within the use effect practice, we are going to create a new component called effect example1.js. Generate the functional component. So let's forget about the side effect for now and let's create a simple counter application. Quickly import the use state hook. Let's declare the necessary state variable to be used. The initial state is going to be a number, and in this case, it's going to be zero. Right within the body, we have to display the count, and then we are going to have a button, and on click of this button, we are going to update the initial state. So I'm just going to do click and here we have to specify the on click so on click we are going to call the set count function and right within the parameter we are going to take in the initial state plus the new update save open up the app component and let's have it rendered over here so we are going to import effect example one from component slash use effect practice slash effect example one and right here let's place a comment on this let's render the effect example one save on the browser and boom all right everything is working perfectly fine can you see okay let me do something beautiful let's customize this application so i just have to remove the click right within the inner html and i'm going to indicate with the plus sign save on the browser and boom look more beautiful like this. I love it. Let's zoom up a little bit. Okay. This is cool. The intention of this lecture is to update the document title when the button is clicked. Let's do that by implementing the use effect. To implement the use effect, first, we have to import it. The use effect is also a function. So we have to invoke it. Come here and I'm going to do use effect. The use effect hooks accept a function as an argument, which gets executed after the component renders. And this is going to be an arrow function. So the function that is passed as an argument right within the use effect hook function is called the effect. 
Okay, so we refer to this function as effect. So right within the effect, we are going to update the document title. Document dot title equal. Let's indicate what the back tick, and I'm going to do. You clicked count times. So we are simply passing the count right here. Okay. When you save and go back to the browser, all right, let's click on the plus button. Do you see? When you observe carefully, you will realize that the title is updated. When I click, can you see? Now it says you clicked two times. I hope you can see that. All right. So initially, the document title reads zero times. So when we click on the button, it is going to cause the component to re-render. And after the component renders, the use effect hook will get called. Click. Can you see? And now we have you clicked one times. Click again. You clicked two times. And just like that. So whenever I click on the button, the state is updated and the component will re-render. When the component re-renders, this will cause the use effect hook to get fired up, and then the document title will change to the updated count value. So this simply implies the use effect hook gets called after the component renders. So now we can say that the behavior of this application is exactly as expected. Let me explain to you what happens under the hood. To cause side effects in functional components, first. We have to import the use effect hook. The use effect hook is a function. We have to invoke it. So after that, we are going to pass a function as an argument right within the use effect function. So right inside the effect, we set the document title using the document title browser API. So whatever you have here within this anonymous function is going to get called after the component renders. So when React renders our component. It will remember the effect we used, okay, and then run our effect after updating the DOM. This happens for every render, including the first one. Take note of these key points. Point number one: the use effect runs after every render. Point number two: use effect is defined inside the component, and by so doing. We will get access to the state and props without having to write any extra code, and that was why we were able to access the document title. To recap, whenever you want to make use of the use effect, you have to import it from React module. After the import, you have to call it right within the component, like this. So right inside the function, we are going to take in an arrow function as an argument. So. Right within the arrow function is where the transformation takes place. So after the component renders, this function would get called. This is all for now, and see you in the next lecture. In this example, we are going to learn how to conditionally run effect. In the previous lecture. We learnt that the effect hook is called after every render, and in most cases, calling the effect after every render might create performance problem. So we need a way to conditionally run effect in a functional component. Let's quickly practicalize it so as to understand it well enough. Quickly create a new file called Effect Example Tool. Right within the use effect practice, we are going to have effect example two dot js. Generate the functional component. Close down the explorer. All beautiful and fine. So as usual, we have to import the use state and the use effect because we want to make use of the both examples. So what we are going to do is to copy everything from the effect example one down here. Effect example one. Highlight, copy, come here. We just have to paste, and after that, we are going to change the components to effect example two. So down here, we just have to effect example two. Save. Open up the app component. 
And as well, we have to render effect example two. Import effect example two dot js. Come here, place a comment on this, and then we are going to render effect example two. Save. Let's go back to the effect example two. So right here, we are going to console log. Use effect is called. Save the application and check out the browser. Click the button. Everything is working as expected. When we inspect the console, you are going to see the expected result. Use effect is called. Now, I want to show you something. Let's quickly implement the input field. Okay, the use state is imported at the top. The state variable is here. And now we have to make the state variable for the input field. Let's assume name, set name, equal, use state. And the initial state is going to be an empty string. It could be a double quote or a single quote. Any of those two will go. All right, let's quickly implement the input field. Let's do it right below the button. Close it up with the self closing tag. And here I'm going to do type equal test. The value is going to be name. So on change, which means when the user begin to type into the input field, call the arrow function, which then give access to the events. Okay. Let's call the set name function. So right within the parameter of the set name function, we are going to use the events to grab whatever the user is typing into the input field, e.target.value. I think by now you should understand the unchanged event well enough. Having done this, head on to the browser and let's check out the behavior. We have to refresh the console. Now, when I begin to type into the input field, we are going to experience a weird behavior. So I do, I do baba. Can you see? When you type into the input field, the use effect is called. Can you see that? Now we have called the use effect seven times. But look, our intention is to call the use effect only when the button is clicked. So when you also click the button, the use effect is called as well. And when you type something into the input field, the use effect is also called. So this call is actually irrelevant and it will definitely slow down the performance of the application. It is not optimal. Okay. The solution to this problem is to conditionally invoke the use effect only when the count value gets updated. Because our intention here is to update the document title when the button is clicked like this. Can you see? So we want the use effect to get fired up only when the button is clicked. But in this case, if you type in something into the input field, the use effect is called. Do something like this. Can you see? All of this stuff are actually irrelevant. Let's fix it quickly. So we learned in the previous lecture that the use effect function accepts two parameters. First is the effect function itself. And second is the dependency array. So right here, to put an end to this problem, we have to specify the second parameter, comma here, and then we are going to take in an empty array. So this application depend on the counts to get updated. So when the counts get updated, we want the document title to be updated as well. So we can say that the application depends on the count variable. So therefore we have to take in the count. So it means the effect is going to get fired up when the count gets updated. So this exactly is how to conditionally run an effect. When you save and go back to the browser. All right, we have to refresh the browser and also refresh the console. Now, when you hit the plus button, the effect is called and the document title get updated. Again, it shows the same result. So when we begin to type into the input field, can you see? We no longer experience that weird behavior. 
So now our effect get called when the count get updated. Can you see? So let's give it a try again, a refresh. When I type it into the input field, nothing happens. The effect is not called simply because we want the effect to be called when the count get updated. So when I hit on the plus button, it is going to cause the component to re-render. And after the component renders, the effect will get called. Can you see? Take a look at the console. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. So now the effect get called only when the state variable count is updated. This is all for now. And in the next lecture, we are going to learn about the use effect cleanup function. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In this lecture, we are going to strengthen our knowledge on use effect hooks. Precisely, we are going to discuss the use effect cleanup function. So, what exactly is the use effect cleanup function? The cleanup function is a function in use effect hook that allows us to tidy up the code before our component on mounts. However, the use effect hook is built in a way that we can return a function right inside of it. And this return function is exactly where the cleanup happens. The cleanup function prevents memory leaks and removes some unnecessary and unwanted behaviors. Take note, you cannot update the state inside the return function. So, for this example, we are going to build a simple application that will log the position of our mouse on the console, starting from the X and Y coordinate. So, right within the use effect practice, let's quickly create a new component called effect example 3. Generate the functional component. Let's quickly import the use state hook and the use effect. Comma, use effect. That's simple as that. So for the X and Y coordinate, we are going to declare the necessary state variable to be used. Right within the component, we are going to have const X, comma, set X equal, use state. And the initial state is going to be a number. In this case, zero. Highlight and duplicate. So here is going to be Y. We have to set Y. That's simple as that. Let's define the function to log the mouse position. Const taking event, set it to our function, and we are going to console log this is mouse event. And right here, we have to call the setter function for the x. And right within the function, we are going to get the x coordinate. E dot client x, highlight and duplicate. So here we're going to get y. So we have to call the setter function for y. Oh, beautiful. Let's quickly call the use effect. Right outside this function, which is within the component, we are going to invoke the use effect. And the use effect is a function that takes in two parameters. The first parameter is an arrow function. Yeah? And the second parameter is going to be the dependency array. But for now, let's keep it like this. So right within the anonymous function, we are going to console log. Use effect is called. And here we want to add the event listener. Window dot add event listener. So we are going to have it on mouse move. When you move the mouse on the browser, we want to pick the X and Y coordinate. Mouse move, comma. Then we are going to invoke the log mouse position. And here is it. That's simple as that. So right within the body, 
we are going to display the position. Let's have a P tag. Coordinate X and Y. Save. We have to render it in the app JS. Come here. We have to import effect example three from component slash effect example three. Highlight. Place a comment on this. Close it up with self closing tag. Save. Let's check out the result on the browser. Alt command I to open up the console. All right, so when you move your mouse, can you see? You can now see the mouse position on the screen. But one thing we don't like is that each time we move the mouse, the effect get called. The effect is called every time the component re-renders. All right, so now we have to condition the effect by passing in the second argument, which in this case is gonna be an empty array. So when we specify the empty array, we are practically telling React that this effect does not depend on any props or state. So there is no reason to call this effect on consequent re-renders, which simply implies it is going to get called only for the first time after the component renders. Let's pass in the empty array as the second parameter. Screw up and here we have to separate it with the comma and then take in an empty array. Save. On the browser, let's reload. Can you see? The effect get called after the component renders for the first time. Now, when I move my mouse around, the effect is not gonna get caught anymore. Do you see? Now we have only the mouse coordinates logged into the console. But when I remove the dependency array, each time you move the mouse around, the component re-renders, and then that will cause this guy over here to fire up. Now see, take a look. Can you see? When I move the mouse, the component re-renders and the effect get fired up. And of course, we do not want the effect to get fired up each time we move the mouse. So therefore, we have to specify the empty array like this. When you specify the empty array, this will cause the effect to get fired up after the component render for the first time. So for the consequence re-renders, the effect is not gonna get called anymore. So if you want your effect to get caught only once, you have to specify the empty dependency array. And that's it. Beautiful. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Welcome back everyone. In the previous lecture, we learned how to mimic component did mount with use effect. So, in this lecture, we are going to learn how to use component will on mount functionality that is available using the effect hook. Basically, what we are going to do in this lecture is to create a container component for the log mouse example that we implemented in the previous lecture. And right within the container, we are going to add the button that will be used to toggle the component display. So quickly create a new file called mouse container. So right within the effect practice, create a new file called mouse container.js. Generate the functional component. Let's quickly import the use state hook. And also, we have to import the effect example three. So the next in line is to declare the necessary state variable for the display. So here I'm gonna invoke the use state hook. And then we are gonna have 
display. Come here. This have to be in comma case. And the initial state is going to be true. Having done this, right within the GSS, we are going to add a button to toggle the display variable between true or false. Toggle display. Specify the on click. So we are going to invoke the setup function for the set display. And now we're going to have here not display. All right. So when this button is click, we are going to switch from true to false. Okay. Each time the button is clicked. And if the display variable is true, we want to render the effect example three component. Let's quickly do it right here. So we are going to have if display is true and n, we are going to render effect example three. Close it up with the soft closing tag. So the initial state of the display is set to true. And for that reason, the effect example three components will be rendered on the screen. And when this button is clicked, the display would be set to false. The effect example three components will be unmounted from the dome. It's as simple as that. Let's quickly render the mouse container in the app JS. All right, highlights, place a comment on these, come here. So we are going to import mouse container from component slash use practice slash mouse container. And of course we have to render it over here. Save. Let's check it out on the browser. All right. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. All right, let's inspect the console. And now when I move the mouse around, the X and Y coordinates is updated and the statement is being printed on the console. And now when I click on the toggle display, this component will be unmounted from the dome. Let's give it a try. Can you see that? Beautiful. Now, the problem here is this. If I try to move the mouse around, the statement will also be printed on the console. Take a look. Do you see? I want you to notice this guy over here. Each time I move the mouse around, the statement will be printed on the console. But look, we have unmounted the component. Even though the component has been removed, the event listener that belongs to the component is still listening and executing. Can you see when I move the mouse around? Do you see that? So the issue is this. Whenever you unmount your component, always make sure to cancel all the subscriptions, the listeners and the fetch request that you made. Simply because we do not want to expose our application to memory leak. What we have to do to solve this problem is to clean up the function. By cleaning up the function, we are going to mimic the component will unmount. And we do that by returning a function right within the first parameter of the use effect. Let's do that quickly. So open up the effect example three. Let me show you. Right within this function, we are going to return another function that is called the cleanup function. And I'm going to do window dot remove event listener. A mouse move, comma, log mouse position. It's as simple as that. And now we are going to log something on the console to actually indicate that we've cleaned up our function. Console.log. Component is unmounted and the code is clean. Save. Let's check it out on the browser. Let's reload. All right. Let's move the mouse. Can you see? We are getting the X and Y coordinates of the mouse position and we have the statement being printed on the console. 
Now, when I click on the toggle display, the effect example three components will be unmounted. Take a look. Let's move the mouse around to check if everything is cool. Can you see? So it is no longer listening to the event. And now on the console, component is unmounted and the code is clean. Take note of this key point. Whenever you want to unmount your component, always make sure to cancel all the subscriptions, the listeners and the fetch request you made. This is all for now. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. With the solid knowledge we've acquired in the previous lectures, in this lecture, we are going to learn how to fetch data from an API endpoint. So, to implement this example, we are going to use the JSON placeholder API. The JSON placeholder is a free online REST API that you can use whenever you need some fake data. And it is mostly used for teaching purposes. So quickly head on to jsonplaceholder.typecode.com. Scroll down to the routes. So over here, we have different endpoints. But in this lecture, we are going to hit the multiple post endpoint. Click to open. Can you see that? So here we have the data in JSON format, which is simply an array of objects with different properties in terms of key value pair. So using the effect hooks, we want to fetch these data and display them on the screen with the help of an external library called Axios. You can as well use the fetch API, but in this lecture, we are going to concentrate on how to use Axios. Quickly head on to VS Code. All right, so here exactly is where the form begins. Right within the component directory, we are going to create a new package called data fetching. And right within the data fetching, we are going to create a new component called fetch multiple posts.js. Generate the functional component. Let's quickly declare the state variables to be used. But before we proceed, first, we have to import the use state hook at the top level. And right here, we are going to declare the state variables for the post. I'm going to do const post comma set post. And the initial state is going to be an empty array. When you observe the array destructuring, you will realize that the element is named with plural word. You know why? It is simply because we are fetching multiple data. So when you are writing code like a pro, you will always have to focus on naming conventions. All right, I talk too much. Let's continue. Okay, so the next in line is to call the effect hook. And before we proceed, we also have to import the use effect at the top level. And here, we are going to call the use effect function. And the use effect function takes in an arrow function as its first parameter. So right within this arrow function is where we are going to make the get request. But before we proceed, we also have to install an external library called Axios. Quickly head on to the terminal. We have to stop the currently running server. Ctrl C to stop and make sure you are in the client's directory. And then I'm going to do node package manager, install Axios. The installation is ongoing. Done. Axios installed successful. And at the top, we also have to import Axios 
from Axios module. That's simple as that. So right within the effect function, we have to make a get request to the URL. And I'm gonna do Axios dot get. And then go back to the browser. So we have to copy the URL. And when we hit this URL, the whole of this post will be retrieved. Sounds good? Beautiful. Let's do that quickly. Copy and then paste it right here. It's as simple as that. Having done this, the get request will return a promise. So we have to log the response. Here, I'm going to do dot, then. So here we are going to take in response right below. We are going to console log the response. If there's any error, we have to catch it and log it on the console as well. Dot catch. Have to catch the error and log it in the console. Error. So we're just catching the error over here. So whatever the error is, we are going to console log the error. It's as simple as that. All right. So having done this, the next in line is to update the initial state with the new post. So for that, we have to call the setter function over here. Set post to response dot data. Cool guys. When you do this, everything will appear as expected. Let's quickly render it on the screen. Come here. I'm going to use the UL tag right within the UL, open and close curly braces to take in JavaScript expressions. And I'm going to do post.map. Let me show you this post right here. This guy, we want to map through whatever we have here and have it displayed on the screen. And you know that the map method takes in an arrow function and this arrow function takes in a parameter. So this parameter over here represents each post in the list. Here we're going to have the li tag. So right within the inner HTML, we can do post dot title. Let me show you quickly. Can you see we have the title over here, the body ID and the user ID. So in my case, I just want to retrieve the title. You can decide to retrieve the body and the rest of them. So now also we have to specify the key. Key equal post dot ID, which is this ID over here. How beautiful. We are going to import fetch multiple posts from component slash data fetching slash fetch multiple post. And um, close this up quickly. Fetch multiple post. Save. Head on to the terminal. We have to start up the server. And there are these. Beautiful. Now we have succeeded in retrieving all of this post over here, which is uh, precisely the title. So if you want to retrieve the body, it is extremely simple. Come here and then you just have to do post dot body save on the browser. Can you see? Now we have retrieved both the title and the body. So you can do that at your end, but I want to keep it simple over here. Save on the browser. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. But when you observe the console, you will see the continuous repetition of data fetching. Can you see? But we want the data to be fetched only on component did mount. So for that, we have to go back to the code and specify the dependency array. Right within the effect function. Right here, let me show you. This is the effect function. So the second parameter is going to be an empty array. 
when you save and go back to the browser let's reload do you see now the console is extremely clean and everything is working perfectly fine as expected this is all for now see you in the next lecture stay focused and always take care welcome back everyone in this lecture we are going to learn how to fetch single post by passing in the post id to the get request which simply implies we are going to retrieve a post based on its id let me break it down quickly head on to jasonplaceholder.typeycode.com scroll to the route In the previous lecture, we hit this endpoint, which retrieved multiple posts. So, in this lecture, we are going to hit this endpoint. When you observe the two endpoints, you will realize that they specified the ID over here as one. Slash post, slash, and then they append one over here. Let me show you. Click to open. And now we have retrieved a post with the ID of one. So if you want to retrieve any post of your choice based on their ID, what you have to do is to move on to the tab and then append the ID over here. So right now I'm going to append 10. So here you will see that we have retrieved a post with the ID of 10. Can you see it clearly? Let's append another ID. Let's do 100. Hit the enter key. Now we retrieved a post with the ID of 100. And now the question is, how do we translate this to code? Knowing that in a real world scenario, when a client wants to fetch a particular post, he or she doesn't have to come to the tab to append their ID manually. So now, how do we translate this to code? Don't worry, I will show you in a GV. Quickly head on to VS Code and let's proceed. Before we proceed, you have to go within the data fetching package and create a new component called fetchsinglepost.js. Here is it. So right within the component, I'm going to do RFCE to generate the functional component. Having done this, let's go to the fetch multiple post to lift some of the code down here. I think here we need lines 1 to 2, so highlight and copy, come here, wipe this off, paste, go back here, and as well, we need from lines 5 to lines 16. Highlight, copy, come here, write within the function, paste it. Beautiful. Let's make the necessary corrections before we proceed. So, knowing fully well that we are retrieving a post, right? So, right on lines 5, we do not have to do post anymore because you will realize that these variables are actually plural words. So, we don't have to do that. Teaching you how to code like a pro. Best practices. Extremely important. This is a variable and this is a setter function to update this variable. Of course, this variable is used to hold the initial state. Simple as ABC. And I know you love my explanations. Sounds good? Beautiful. All right, let's continue. Having done this, the next line is to make some changes on lines eight. Because in this particular scenario, we want to grab the ID dynamically, right? So we want to impute the ID right on the input field. So what I'm going to do here first is to change this to backtick. And the backtick is located at the top left corner of the keyboard, right below the escape key. Having done this, let's quickly append the ID. So I'm going to do slash. Now we don't have to do ID like this. You know why? It is simply because we want to impute the ID by ourselves. So I'm going to do here dollar sign and then open and close curly bracket. 
So now we can append the ID and this will come dynamically. Having done this, we also have to create the state variables for the ID. So I'm going to do const ID comma set ID. The initial state of the ID is going to be empty just like this. Yeah. Okay, fine. So write what in the JSS, the next in line is to convert this to a controlled component, simply because we have to make use of the uh, input field. So I'm going to do input type, input type is test. And um, let's close it up with the self closing tag. The on change here is equal. We're going to gain access to the event. Outside here, we have to update the input field. So I'm going to do like this set ID because the ID is what is going into the input field. Now I'm going to do oops e dot target dot value. It's as simple as that. Lastly, we have to display it with the head one tag. You can display it with any tag that you like, but for me, I just want to use the head one tag for teaching purpose. Post dot what do we want to display? We can decide to display the body or the title, whichever one you want to display. So now let's do title like this. When you save, oops, now we have errors. So let's come here. It says set post is not defined on lines 12. All right, guys, take a look. Here on lines 12, we need to change this to post knowing that uh, we actually made changes over here, yeah? So when you save the application, go back to the browser and boom. Now we have the input field here. So when I do one, nothing happens. You know why? It is simply because our application now depends on the ID to get fire up. Do you understand? Let me show you. Come here. So here we just have to do ID when you save on the browser. Look, now we have the post with the ID of one. Let me show you. Let's do two. Can you see three, four, five, six. Now when I change the ID to 100, it retrieve a post. Let me show you on the console. So I have to refresh then alt command I to open up the console. So here I'm going to do the ID. I'm going to do two like this. Check out the data. Now we have the post with the ID of two. This is the post body and this is the post title. This is all for now. Do well to subscribe and hit the like button. In this lecture, we are going to learn how to trigger the effect on button click. So, the intention of this lecture is to make the get request within the click handler. To proceed, we need a state variable whose value will only change on button click. And for now, the only value that changes in this application is this ID. So, let me show you quickly. Let's zoom up a little bit. So when I do one, can you see? So this exactly is what I'm talking about. But right now, we want to do this on button click. So we do not want to implement it this way. Quickly head back to VS Code and let's proceed. To implement such functionality, let's quickly declare a new state variable whose value will change when the button is clicked. Okay, right here, I'm going to do just like this. And then I will call this button click ID. And of course, this will be changed like this. It's as simple as that. So we are going to leave the initial state like this. And so let's quickly implement the button. All right, so before we proceed, we have to format the code to make it look clean a little bit. Beautiful. 
So now we are going to have the button over here. On click of this button, we want to invoke a function. And the name of the function is handle click. And so the button type is equal button and then the value is going to be ID. And right to put in the inner test, I'm going to do fetch a post. All right, we are good to go. Just one thing left right now. And so we want to set the button click ID to the new ID in the input field. And how do we do that? We have to do that right within this function. And here at the top, we are going to have a function. Const handle click. Set it to our function. And then we have to call the setter function for the set button click. And now we are updating it with the current ID that the user will key in into the input field. Like this. It's as simple as that. So with this, we are setting the button click ID to the ID that will be captured from the input field. And so the next in line is to allow the effect to depend on the ID from the button click ID and not from the regular on change. Let me show you quickly. Can you see? Previously, our effect is depending on this ID that will be captured from the input field. But now we want to set it to the button click ID, which is this guy over here. And as well, here, we have to change it to button click ID. So the ID that we captured from the input field is being stored right inside this guy over here. Let's check it out on the browser. Save on the browser. Let's do one. Hit on fetch. Beautiful. Let's do two. Hit on fetch. Perfect. Friends. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. This is all for now. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. Welcome back everyone. Now we are going to discuss a very interesting and powerful hooks called Use Contest. But before we proceed, it is good we understand what the contest API is and how it works. So after that, we will explore the use contest hooks which make things easier. So what is a contest API? Let's quickly consider a React application that has several components. Now at the top is the app component, which is of course the root component of every React application. Nested within the app component are several other independent and isolated components in different tree levels. And we have component A, B, and C at the first level. Component X is nested within component B. Component Y is nested within component C. And component Z is nested within component Y. And now the challenge we have here is to display the total price of an item in component A, X, and Z. And the price of the item will be maintained as a property in the app component. So to be able to display the price in the nested component, we have to pass down the price as props. All right, so for component A to receive this price, we have to directly pass it down as props. And that is quite simple and straightforward. For component X to receive this price, we have to pass it through the intermediate component B down to component X. For component Z to receive the price contest, we have to pass it through the intermediate component C and Y. All right, so when you observe the tree of component carefully, you will realize that component B 
C and Y do not need the probes, but we still have to pass the probes through the component in order to get to the required component where the data will be consumed. So, in this scenario, component B, C and Y is called probes carriers. They do not make use of the props, but they help to carry the props to the required component of concern. So, the process of passing props through the nested component is called props drilling. So right now, I want you to close your eyes and imagine that we have over 25 nested components over here. It then means that all of this component in between will have to forward the props down to the component of concern. And of course, that will get our code messy and hereby becomes a problem for certain types of props that is required by many components in our application. Props such as the language preferences, authentication users, and the UI theme. Okay, so won't it be nice if we can directly send data to the required component of concern without having to probes drill through the nested components? Okay, so here exactly is where Contest API comes in. Contest provide a way to pass data through the component tree without having to probe drill manually across the nested components. In other words, React Contest allows us to share data across our component more easily. It helps to avoid probes drilling. Yeah, so this is all for now. In the next lecture, we are going to see how the Contest API was used before the introduction of hooks. And after that, we are going to practicalize the use Contest hook to see the flexibility it brings to the table. All right, so let's practicalize it in the next lecture. See you then. In this lecture, we are gonna have a practical understanding of Contest API and how it works. So, we are gonna implement a price contest that will enable components in different tree levels to read a props that is passed at the top level. And right in this example, we are gonna use component Z to display the price of items without having to props drill through the intermediate component C and Y. And by the way, I have created a React application called Practice Contest. So quickly pause the lecture at your end and then generate a new React application. Alright, having done that, let's quickly create the components directory. Right within the SRC, right click, new folder, components. And right within the components directory, we are going to create component C, Y, and Z. Component Z.js. And lastly, we are going to have component Y.js. Beautiful. So I just have to take the Z to the extreme over here. Command B to close down the explorer. And then let's generate the functional components right within the files. And now we are gonna focus on the right edge of the tree. Okay, so when you observe the right edge of the tree, you will realize that Component Z is nested within Component Y. Component Y is nested within Component C. And lastly, Component C is nested right within the app component. So let's quickly follow this pattern and transform it into code. So following the pattern of the tree, Component Z is nested in Y. So here is Component Y. 
we are going to import component Z from component Z. And then let's render it over here. Component Y is nested within component C. Go back to component C, import component Y. And then here we have to render component Y. Lastly, component C is then rendered in the app component. Go to the app component, import component C from component slash component C. And right here, we have to render component C. It's as simple as that. All right, so here exactly is where the fun begins. To implement contest, we have to follow four steps. Step one is to create the contest using the create contest method right at the top. And please do not do it right here. Okay, don't do it within the component. It has to be outside here. Beautiful. And now we are going to create a price contest. Const price contest equal react dot create contest. Having done this, step two is to take your created contest and wrap the contest provider around your component tree. So here I just have to highlight this guy for now and then cut it off. And over here, we are going to do price contest dot provider. Perfect. And then we have to paste the component in between. It's as simple as that. All right. Let's move on to step three. Now we are going to put the required value on your contest provider using the value prop. What I'm going to do right here is to take in props, which is value equal. Now we have to specify a price and I'm going to do $200. And lastly, step four is to consume the value within any component using the contest consumer. So before we proceed, we have to export the contest. Come here. I'm going to do so this guy right here, we will be able to import it in a different module. And now the challenge here is to consume this value in component Z without having to props drill through component C and Y. Let's do that quickly. Come to component Z. So at the top, we are going to import price contest from the app component. Let's quickly wipe this off. So here we're going to have price contest dot consumer. And we are going to have price. So right here, we are going to return a div. Right within the div, we have to display the price. Save. Make sure to run your application and then check out the browser. And here's it. Can you see that? Beautiful. Let me zoom up a little bit. All right. So now we've been able to consume the price that is maintained in the app component right in component Z, even without having to drill across the intermediate component. Friends, contest is indeed powerful and I love it. Okay, so the next in line is to take in another contest because in your application, chances are you are going to have multiple value to be consumed in a different component. So let's see how to implement multiple contests. Head on to the app component. Let's also assume we want to display the name of the item. Okay, so first we displayed the item price. And now we have to display the item name. So let's quickly create a new contest. 
export const and I'm gonna call it item contest equal react dot create contest. Haven't exported it. We will be able to use it in different files. So quickly here it is gonna be nested within item contest dot provider. Highlight the closing tag, command X to cut, and then paste it here. Let's quickly format the code to have a proper indentation. Beautiful. You can format the code with Predia. Of course, you should know how to do that by now. All right, so having done this, we have to provide the contest with a value. So the item contest is gonna have a value prop. Let's assume Samsung. So having done this, we have to consume this contest. Head on to component Z. So right here, we also have to import the item contest. Having done that, come here, highlight, command X to cut. And then we are gonna return the item contest dot consumer. Open and close curly brackets. And then we are gonna have the function over here. And right within this function, we are gonna return the div. Command V to paste the div. And over here, we also have to display the item. And then just have to do item like this. So let's make it more readable. Here I'm gonna do price contest. And here I'm gonna do item contest. All right, so let's quickly format the code with Predia. Perfect. Save. Let's check it out on the browser. Can you see that? Price contest is $200. The item is Samsung. Friends, this is extremely awesome and I love it. So now we are able to get multiple contest value. But one thing I want to say is that this approach is quite bulky. So to reduce the complexity, we are going to make use of the use contest hooks. And then you are going to see how we can consume multiple contests just in few lines of codes. This is all for now. And in the next lecture, we are going to practice the use contest hook. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In the previous lecture, we learned how to consume multiple contests with the render props pattern. And in this lecture, we are going to consume that same multiple contest using the use contest hooks. Let's practicalize it quickly. All right, so there's no need to create a new component. So we are gonna use component Y to consume the contest value right in this lecture. Head on to component Y. One thing you have to keep in mind is that the steps to implement contest remain exactly the same. But the only thing that will change is the pattern of consumption. Okay, so use context is very easy to consume context value with few lines of code. To proceed with the use context hook, first, we have to import it at the top. Place a comma right here and then use context. The next in line is to import the necessary context to be used. Import price contest from app component. And then we also have to import the item contest. They are both coming from the app component. Having done this, the next in line is to invoke the use contest hook. All right, so the use contest is a function. So we have to invoke it. Right within the use contest function, we are going to pass in the price and the item contest as parameter. 
So you use contest and then we are going to pass in the price contest, highlight, duplicate. And here we are going to pass in the item contest. The use contest will return the contest value. So let's assign it to a constant variable. Here I'm going to do const and I'm going to call the variable price. And here I'm going to call the variable item just like this. It's as simple as that. Let's wipe this off. And lastly, we have to consume the contest. And friends, take a look. It is extremely easy to consume the contest. We just have to reference these variables. All right, let me show you quickly. Here I'm going to do price. Okay. And I'm going to do here item save on the browser and there are these can you see that beautiful we can now consume multiple contests just in one line this is fantastic and i love it okay so to be honest with you the introduction of hook in react make things very easy so when you compare the previous implementation you will definitely appreciate the introduction of hooks in React.js. And now the question is, when should we use React Contest? React Contest is great when you are passing data that can be used in different component in your application. And these types of data includes team data like dark or light mode, user data, which is the currently authenticated user. And lastly, location specific data like user language or locale. And another question that comes to mind is what exactly is the problem that React Contest solve? React Contest help us to avoid the problem of props drilling. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused. And always take care. Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we are going to discuss the use reducer hook. Use reducer hook is an alternative to the use state hook. Therefore, the use reducer is a hook that is used for complex state management. Discussing the code, the use reducer is a function that accepts two parameters. First is the reducer method. And the second parameter is the initial state. And just like the use state hooks, the use reducer returns an array of two entries. The first element in the array is the variable that holds the state. And the second element is the dispatch method and the dispatch method is used to dispatch an action. Then we assign it like this. Now let's break it down starting from the parameters. So the first parameter is the reducer method. Yeah? So the reducer method also takes in two parameters. First is the state. Second is the action, and then it returns a new state, which is gonna be a switch case. And the switch expression is gonna be an action. All right, so don't worry. In the next lecture, when we begin to practicalize it, you will definitely understand it well enough. This is all for now. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In the previous lecture, we had a detailed introduction about use reducer hooks. So, in this lecture, we are going to proceed with the practical example. We are going to demonstrate this example by implementing a simple counter application. So, we will be able to increment the counter value, decrement, and even reset the counter value to zero. Though the application might appear simple, but again, it exhibits the pattern that you will see in your everyday coding. 
quickly within the components directory, let's create a new package called use reducer practice. Within this package, let's create a new component called my counter one. Generate the functional component. Right within the GSS, go ahead to create three different buttons. So right within the div, we are going to have a button, the increment, and I'm going to duplicate it twice. And this is going to be decrement, and this is going to be reset button. So the next in line is to create the counter that will be displayed in the JSS. So for that, we need the use reducer hook. To implement the use reducer hook, first, we have to import it at the top level. So here I'm going to do use reducer. Having done that, just like other hooks that we studied in the previous lecture, the use reducer hook is also a function. We have to invoke it. So right within the component, we are going to invoke the use reducer hook. Let's quickly have a resense of the syntax. Previously, we learned that the use reducer hook accepts two arguments. The first argument is a reducer method, and the second argument is the initial state. So right within the parameter, we are going to have the reducer method, comma, and then the initial state. Having done this, the next in line is to declare the initial state and define the reducer function. So go outside the component, right at the top, we are going to have const initial state equal zero. Let's quickly define the reducer function. Const reducer set it to R function. So the reducer function accepts two parameters. First is the current state and the second parameter is the action. So we're going to have the current state, comma, the action. And so the reducer function also returns a value which is the new state. And here for teaching purpose, I'm going to do return new state like this. Don't worry, we are going to see how it goes in the future. For the transition to take place, we have to trigger the second parameter in the reducer function, which is the action. So you can think of the action as an instruction that is given to the reducer function. And based on the specification of the action, the reducer will perform the necessary state transition. So for this example, we are going to have three different actions. The increment, decrement, and the reset action. So let's quickly wipe this off. In the case of reducer, the common practice to implement code based on its action is to use the switch case. So here we are going to do switch. The switch expression is going to be action. Following the requirements of our application, the action here is going to be increment, decrement, and the reset action. So here we're going to have the first case to be increment, colon, and we are going to return the current state plus one. It's as simple as that. And here, I just have to duplicate this, duplicate it twice, and here we are going to have the decrement. The new state is going to subtract one from the initial state. And here we are going to have case reset, which is to reset the state to value zero. And that is the initial state. So this is going to return the initial state. And lastly, we have to specify the default case. In this case, we are going to return the state itself. It's as simple as that. 
Now, the next in line is to dispatch the action. Similarly to the use state hooks, use reducer returns a pair of value which we can grab using the array destructuring syntax. Here I'm going to do const right within. And here we are going to have the dispatch method. And then assign it like this. The use reducer returns the current state, which in this case we call it count, alongside with the dispatch method. And the dispatch method is used to execute a code corresponding to a particular action. So, the count over here is a variable that is used to store the initial state. So quickly write within the JSS, we will use the head one tag to display the count. Now we're going to do head one, right within, we have to display the count, which is this guy right here that is used to hold the initial state and as well the state that will be updated. This is just used to hold the state, okay? And this guy over here is used to dispatch the code based on its action. You are going to see that in the GFE. So right within the button, we have to specify the on click. And within the on click, we are going to take in an arrow function that will be used to invoke the dispatch method. And the dispatch method is going to be used to execute a code based on its action. And in this case, we have action increment. It's as simple as that. So now I'm going to copy this. See the way I copied it, right? From the opening curly bracket to the on click. Copy, come here and paste. So we just have to change this to decrement because we want to dispatch the decrement action. So come here like this and paste it as well. In this case, we want to dispatch the reset action. So when we dispatch the increment action, it is going to add one to the initial count value. When we dispatch the decrement action, it will subtract one from the initial count value. And lastly, when we dispatch the reset action, it will reset the count to zero, which is the initial state. Let's quickly render it in the app component. Come to the top and then we have to import my counter one from component slash use reducer practice slash my counter one. And when you scroll down, we just have to render my counter one. Close it up with the self closing tag. Save and please make sure to run the application on the terminal. Let me show you. Can you see? My application is currently running. And on the browser, there are these. Can you see that? Let's give it a try by clicking on the buttons. I click on the increment button. It increments to one. I click on decrement. It decrements to zero. And again, I hit on the increment, increment, increment. And then let me try reset this time. Beautiful. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. So to recap, go back to VS Code and let me show you quickly. To make use of the use reducer, first, you have to import it at the top. And then, the use reducer is a function. Therefore, you have to invoke it. And as well, this function takes in two parameters. First is the reducer method. And second is the initial state. Yeah? And also, the use reducer hook returns an array of two values. Which in this case, the initial state and a dispatch method. The dispatch method is used to dispatch the action. And the variable count over here is used to store the value of the state. Okay? So when you go to the top where we have the reducer function, this guy over here, which is the first parameter in the use reducer hook. So here, the reducer function takes in two parameters. First, is the state and then the action. So in the case of a reducer, 
The convention to implement code based on its action is to use the switch keys. And that is why we have the switch over here. And right here in the switch, we implemented the actions. Okay, so we have case increments. This will return a new state that will add one to the initial state. And of course, you should know that the initial state is also the second parameter right within the use reducer function. And here is it. Okay, so when the action is increment, it is going to add one to the initial state. And when the action is decrement, we are also subtracting one from the initial state. And then when the action is reset, we reset the value to zero. And here we have the default state of the application. Right within the JSS, we implemented an on click to call the dispatch method. So right within the dispatch method, we specified the action. This is all for now. And in the next lecture, we will take more complex example. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. The second example of the use reducer will be examined in this lecture. And in this lecture, we will employ the state object and action object rather than the straightforward state and action that we implemented in the previous lecture. So quickly within the use reducer practice, create a new component called myCounter2.js. Quickly open up my counter one and here is it. Highlight and copy all the code. Head on to my counter two and paste. Let's quickly make the necessary corrections. Here we just have to change my counter one to my counter two. When you save, beautiful. The next in line is to transform the current state variable to an object. Scroll to the top and here is it. So what I'm going to do right now is to wipe this off. Now we have to set it to an object. Right within the object, I'm going to do counter A, set it to zero, just like this. And right within the UI, now we are going to do here, count dot counter A. The count represents the entire state object. The next in line is to convert our simple string action into an object. And here is it. So right within the dispatch method, I'm just going to highlight and then cut the string. Now we have to convert it to an object. So within this object, we are going to take in a property called type. Type. And the action type is increment. So here also we have to change it to an object, highlight and cut the string, change it to an object and take in the type. So the action type is decrement. Same thing here. It's as simple as that. And with this, we are going to dispatch an action based on the action type. So right within the reducer function, scroll to the top. The switch expression is going to be action dot type. So for the increment and decrement action, we are going to return the new state object. Highlight and wipe it off. Let's specify an object. Right within the object, we are going to do counter A, then state dot counter A plus one. It's as simple as that. Same thing here. Specify the object. Counter A. State dot. Counter A minus one. Let's paste this out a little bit. The component state and action is now transformed into an object. And that's it. Render this component in the app JS and let's see what we have on the browser. Import my counter two from component slash use reducer practice slash my counter two. Let's highlight this and place a comment on it. Then we are going to render 
mycounter2.js. Close it up with the soft closing tag. Save the application and make sure it is running right within the terminal. And on the browser, boom. Let's check it out. Increment, decrement, reset. Okay, let's do it again. Increment, decrement, and reset. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. Beautiful. And now the question is, why would one prefer this approach compared to the previous approach? All right, so we are going to demonstrate an example that will give a valid answer to this question. So with that, you will get to understand it well enough. So let's assume we want to dispatch different value and result. Say we have two extra buttons to increment and decrement count by five. That would be possible and very easy if the action is an object. And when you check out the action object, you will realize that it has only one property, which is the action type. So we are going to add another property to the action object. And that property would be called value, which will represent the number that will be used to increment or decrement the count value. So to the buttons that we created earlier on, we are going to add an extra property to it. Come here, comma, and then value. We have to set it to one simply because we want this button to increment the initial state value by one. Place a comma right here, taking the value property and set it to one. So this will decrement the initial state by one. And now in this example, we want two extra buttons that will be used to increment and decrement the count value by five. Copy from lines 25 to 26, duplicate it. And here I'm going to do increment five. Here I'm going to do increment five. All right, so here I'm going to do five, the value five. Having done this, we also have to go back to the reducer function and then we do not have to hand code it like this. What I'm going to do right now is plus action dot value. And this value is this. So here is going to be action dot value. So this value represents each of this guy over here, all of this guy over here. Let's quickly save the application to check out the result on the browser. Let's give it a try by hitting on the buttons. Increment by one, beautiful. Decrement by one, perfect. Increment five, can you see that? Decrement by five. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. And when I hit the reset button, take a look. Beautiful. So by making use of the action as an object, we can use multiple data in the reducer function. So this is one of the answer to the question we raised earlier on in this lecture. Now let's demonstrate the second example to give more valid answer to the question that was raised earlier on. And in this example, we are going to focus on state as an object. So let's assume you want to implement multiple counters. The best way we can do that is when the state is an object. Scroll to the top. So we are going to have a new counter right now. And this will be called counter B. I'm going to set it to 15. To update the value of counter B, we have to create two more switch cases. Come right here. What I'm going to do right now, because we've created it earlier on, I'm just going to highlight from lines 11 to 13. Duplicate it. Watch me as I'm going to select the counter A. And then we have to highlight all the occurrences of counter A within the action that we duplicated. Take your cursor to the right edge and then wipe it off. Here I'm going to do counter B. It's as simple as that. And now we have two different properties as the state object. To get the expected result, we have to merge the state property. Let me show you how to do that. Dot, dot, dot. 
state. Place a comma. I'm just going to copy and then paste it all around like this. Like this. So lastly, we have to implement the button to dispatch the action on on click. So when I scroll down, I'm just going to copy increment 5. Come here. Let's make a div. Paste it within this div. And then I'm going to call this increment counter B. Highlight. Copy. Come here. And paste. So this will be decrement counter B. We have to display counter B. So here I'm going to use the H2 tag to display counter B. Count dot counter B. So what I'm going to do right now is I just have to specify that this is counter A and this is counter B. When you save on the browser, beautiful. So the initial state of counter A is zero. Let me show you. Right in the state object. Here is it. For counter B is 15. And here is it. So when we click on this button, we should be able to manage the both states. So that is the beauty of using states as an object. Okay. And now let's give it a try. Can you see? Working perfectly fine as expected. I hit on reset. And let's try it for counter B. Counter B is not working. You know why? Let me show you quickly. Come here. So right within the counter B, we are dispatching the increment action. And this action is for counter A. So if you want counter B to work, you have to specify the action for counter B. And then dispatch that action. Let me show you. Right here, this is for counter A and this is for counter A. So now I'm going to do increment B. And here I'm going to do decrement B. When we come right here and do increment B, decrement B. Save and check it out on the browser. Reload. Let's give it a try on counter A. Can you see? Reset. Give it a try on counter B. Take a look. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. All right. So in summary, by using action as an object, you are able to pass additional data to the reducer function. And by using state as an object, we are able to maintain and keep track of multiple state variables. And in this case, here are the state variables, counter A and B. And we are able to do this simply because the state is an object, okay? Which is this guy that you see over here. Okay, let me show you quickly. I just have to cut this off. And then here is the object. Simply because the state is an object, we are able to maintain these guys over here. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. In the previous example, we were able to keep track of two different counters using state as an object. And to update the counters, we have to create additional switch cases in the reducer method. But if we have two counters with the same state transition, there is more simpler approach to do that. So quickly create a new component called myCounter3. Right within the use reducers practice. Open up my counter one. Let's highlight and copy all the code. And then paste it here. We just have to change the component name to my counter three. Save. Open up the app component and let's have it rendered. Highlight this. Place a comment on it. And then come to the top. We have to import my counter three from component slash use reducers practice slash my counter three. Let's render it over here. Save on the browser. Boom. 
the application is fine. Now we have a simple counter application. Head on to counter three. So the next in line is to add another state counter with exactly the same transaction, which is increment, decrement, and reset functionality. If that is the case, what we are going to do is to create additional use reducer. So here we are going to have const and I'm going to call this guy count two comma and I'm going to call this guy dispatch two. And then we invoke the use reducer. And for sure, the use reducer takes in the reducer method as its first argument, and then the initial state as its second argument. So right within the div, we have to dispatch this guy. So let's do that quickly. Highlight from lines 23 to 26. Copy, come here. We are gonna make another div and then paste it within this div. So this is gonna be dispatch to like this, like this. And here we have two, we are gonna show count two, which is this guy over here that is used to hold the state. Okay, let's make it readable a little bit. I'm gonna do just like this. When you save and head onto the browser, can you see? We have the first counter and then the second counter. Let's give it a try. Increment, decrement, reset. Increment, decrement, reset. Can you see? Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. All right, so when working with different state variable that has exactly the same state transaction, I highly suggest you use the multiple reducer approach. And this will help avoid complexity of merging the state if it were to be an object. And also to prevent us from duplicating code in the reducer function. I understand that this lecture is quite tricky, but I highly suggest you play the video over and over again to get it stick to your memory. This is all for now and in the next lecture, we are going to learn how to manage global state with use reducer and use contest. See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and do take care. At the component level specifically, you have seen an example of local state management with use reducer. However, there may come a time when you want to communicate the state amongst components. So, consequently, you might want to operate with the global state. And now the question is, how do we approach that? By combining use reducer and use contest, you will be able to manage global state. So in this lecture, we will learn how to use use contest and use reducer to manage and distribute global state. That will be a pretty great combo. All right. Now let's consider a simple counter application with six different component. Component A, B, C, and X, Y, Z. So the state of the counter will be maintained in the app JS. And the assignment here is to share the counter state among component A, X, and Z. And also, we are going to share the method to update the state deep down the component tree without having to props drill across the intermediate components. And the solution to this problem is to use the contest API. So since we are working with hooks, we are going to use the use contest hook to provide the necessary value that is needed to manage the counter state in component A, X, and Z. Let's get started. So right here, I have cleaned up the app component. It is quite simple and I believe you can do it at your end. So you just have to wipe off all the components that we imported and then delete all the renders. 
I want to explain this example in a way that you will understand it well enough. Now, let's begin. Within the components directory, we are going to create a new package called use contest with reducer. Right within this package, we are going to create component A, X, and Z. Quickly generate the functional components in all the files. Having done this, the next in line is to create a simple counter in the app component. App component. And wait, we have done this before. So all we are going to do is to copy it from my counter1.js. My counter1. Then I'm just going to copy from lines 5 to 16. Go back to the app component and then paste it at the top. So let's quickly import the use reducer at the top level. So we have to place a comma right here, and then use reducer. So right within the app component, which is this guy right here, we are going to invoke the use reducer method. And of course, this takes in two parameters. One is the reducer method, and the second parameter is the initial state. And all of these will return an array of two entries. I'm going to do const. The first element is going to be a count, which is going to store the value of the entire state. And the next element within this array is going to be the dispatch method. So we have to assign it like this. It's as simple as that. This will be used to hold the entire state, which is to store the value of the entire state. And then this will be used to dispatch the action. Don't worry. When we proceed with the implementation, you definitely will understand it well enough. Let's quickly display the value of the state right within the GSS. And of course, we are going to render component A x and z go to the top we have to import component a from component slash use contest with reducer slash component a and then we are going to import component x component z let's have it render over here So the intention here is to dispatch an action right within these components. Okay, so we want to manage this state over here, right, in component A, X, and Z. And that exactly is what the intention is. So this over here is referred to as the global state, and we want to manage that state within the nested components. Teaching good? Beautiful. If we have to dispatch the action within these components, we have to make use of the contest in order to provide the count value and the dispatch method to be consumed within these components. So let's quickly create the contest by using the create contest API. Right at the top, we are going to have const count contest equal react dot create contest so having created the contest we also have to export it so having done this we have to provide this contest with a value and then wrap the entire component in the contest provider and specify the value attribute 
which is the can value and the dispatch method. Let me show you quickly. So right here, we are going to wrap up the entire application with the contest we created. And it is the count contest dot provider because we have to provide it with the value. Highlight and then cut. Come here, paste it. And now we have to provide the value. Value equal. We have to take in an object. So we are going to have the count state to be count, comma, and the count dispatch is going to be dispatch. So having done this, when you check out the browser, you see this error. Initial state is not defined. Come back and we have to define the initial state right at the top. Const initial state equal zero. So when you do this and check out the browser, can you see? We have the initial count to be zero. And this is the value of the state. Then we have component A, X, and Z. So the next in line is to consume the state and the dispatch method. So for that, we are going to use the contest hook. Head back to VS Code. Let's quickly head on to component A.js. And over here at the top, we have to import use contest. And as well, we have to import the contest that we created in the app component. Import. And the name of the contest is count contest from app.js. All right. So it is time to consume the contest. So right within the component, we are going to invoke the use contest. Let's take in the count contest as its parameter. And then we have to assign it to a variable. Const can contest equal like this. Okay. So having done this, we would be able to access the dispatch method. Head on to my counter one and copy the button and then paste it in component A. Okay. Let's copy everything from here, including the H1 tag. And then head on to component A. And over here, we just have to paste it in between the div tag. Just like this. Let's quickly format to have a proper indentation. Good. So now the count is going to be, let's take off the head one tag for now. We don't need it. So here we are no longer going to have the dispatch like this. So we are going to do count contest dot count dispatch. Let me show you in the app JS. We are getting this guy over here in order to dispatch each of these actions. It's as simple as that. So come back to component A. We have to do it for all of the dispatch. So I'm just going to select all the occurrences of dispatch and wipe it off. Paste the contest dispatch right here. Save and check out the browser. Can you see? The initial state is zero and then increment decrement reset everything is working perfectly fine so we just have to manage exactly the same state in the rest of the components that exactly is the intention of the lecture come here i'm just going to highlight everything over here in component a copy head on to component x highlight and then wipe it off paste now we have to change the occurrences of component a to component x Save. Let's check it out. Beautiful. It is turning out good. Again, to component Z, highlight, wipe it off, paste. Change it to component Z. So let's check it out to see if we are able to manage this state over here, right within component A, X, and Z. Check it out on the browser. All right, so let's make the component name to be descriptive. Come to component Z and paste it here. Sorry, component X. And then lastly, component Z. 
save and on the browser boom so let's check it out if we are able to control the global state from component a let's click the increment button in component a can you see everything is working perfectly fine as expected when you decrement beautiful and then when you reset boom let's try it out in component x increment decrement reset component z increment decrement reset friends this is extremely awesome so now we are able to manage and control the global state right within component a x and z and this is possible with use contest and use reducer and that's it this is all for now and see you in the next lecture stay focused and always take care use state versus use reducer to show the comparison between the use state and the use reducer we are going to exemplify it by fetching data from an api endpoint so in this example we are going to see how to fetch data using the effect hook with the help of the use state hooks to maintain the state transition or transformation and in the next lecture we are going to see how to fetch the same data with use effect hook using the use reducer to maintain the state transition and by so doing you will be able to compare the use state and the use reducer in order to know when and how to use them within the components directory let's quickly create a new package called use state and use reducer right within this package let's create a new component called use state data fetch generate the functional component what we are going to do in this lecture is to make an api call to fetch data as soon as the component mounts and while the data is being fetched we will display the loading indicator so when the data is fetched successfully we will hide the loading indicator and display the data lastly we will cancel the loading indicator and show the error message if a problem arises while loading the data let's quickly define the state variables and their setter methods and before we proceed with that you have to import the use state from react so we have to declare the necessary state variables to be used and here we are going to have is loading comma set is loading and the default state will be set to true so when we make an api call you are going to see the loading bar right on the browser and over here we are going to have the error and then we are going to set the error over here this should be comma case and the initial state right here is going to be an empty string lastly we are going to have the post and this should be also in comma case and the initial state is going to be an object so this will be used to hold the initial state of the data and this will be used to update the initial state of the data so in other word when we fetch the data this will be used to update the initial state of the post when the data is processing under the hood we will display the loading indicator and this is needed when something goes wrong and lastly this will be used to store and update the state with the new data that will be fetched the next in line is to make the api call and update the necessary state to make the api call we definitely have to invoke the use effect first we have to import it at the top and right here we have to invoke the effect 
and the effect takes in two parameters. First is the function, which is in this case a narrow function. And second is a dependency array. And I'm going to leave it as an empty dependency array. Having done this, the next in line is to make a get request. And to do that, first, we have to install Axios. And of course, we installed Axios earlier on in the previous lecture. But if you do not have it installed, you just have to come to the terminal and then Ctrl C to stop the currently running server. And then we are going to do node package manager install Axios. I have it installed already. So there is no need to do this the second time. But if you do not have it in your machine, you just have to hit the enter key to have it installed. Let me wipe it off. Scroll to the top and then haven't installed Axios. We have to import it at the top. Import Axios from Axios. The function within the use effect hook is called the effect. And here exactly is where the side effect takes place. So right within the effect, we are going to make a get request. And so we are going to do axios dot get. It's as simple as that. We are going to use the JSON placeholder endpoint. So quickly head on to the JSON placeholder and copy the URL of a post. And we want to target the route that will return a specific post. I'm just going to copy, come here, write what in the string, I'm just going to paste. Whenever we make a GET request, it always return a promise. Therefore, we are going to have a then block. Dot then. So when the request is successful, we have to make some state transition. We're going to have here response. So when the request is successful, we have to set the is loading to false. And also, we have to update the initial state with the new data that we fetched. So I'm going to do set post response dot data. And lastly, we have to set the error to an empty string simply because the fetch is successful. Set error to an empty string. This happens when the fetch is successful, but not every time you will have a smooth ride. Yeah, so sometimes you may have some problem, the data fetching will not be successful. So if something goes wrong, we have to trap the error and handle it in the catch block. Let's quickly specify the catch block quickly. Right after this guy, which is the den, the promise that it returns, we are going to have the catch. And what are we going to catch? We are going to catch any existing error that is found. We also have to set is loading to force. We have to set post to an empty object, which is the initial state of the post. Okay, let me show you at the top. And here is it. Right? Perfect. And then, we have to set error to something like this. So we are going to do, oops, something went wrong. Having done this in the effect, the next in line is to display the data in the JSS. If the component is busy loading the data, we are going to display the loading indicator. And else, when the data is successfully fetched, we have to display the data. Right within the curly bracket, because over here, we have to take in some JavaScript expression. And I'm going to do, if it's loading, is equal to true. All right, so if the application is loading, we are going to say, data is loading. And else, if the data is fetched, we have to get the post dot title. Let's check out the post. Okay, we can get the title or the body. Let's get the post body.
And also, we want to display the error on the screen. So if there's an error, we have to display the error, which is this right up over here. And else, if there's no error, we have to set it to null. When you save the application, make sure to render it in the app component. Come here. And we did all of this in the previous lecture. So I just placed a comment on them. Import. Use state data fetch from component slash use state and use reducer slash use state data fetch. I talk too much. All right. So let's have it rendered right within the app component. Use state data fetch. We also have to run the application over here. And I'm going to do npm start. Wait for it. It shows the loading indicator. And when the process was successful, it then showed the data. So when you reload the application, you definitely will see the loading indicator. Can you see? Though it appears within the twinkle of an eye, but if your internet is quite slow, you are going to see it within some few seconds. Take a look. Can you see? Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. So let me show you something because we also want to make sure that the error indicator is also working perfectly fine. So head back to VS Code and right here, I'm just going to alter the URL. So this URL is incorrect. Therefore, the error is going to be displayed on the screen. When you save on the browser, reload. Oops, something went wrong. The purpose of this example is to check out the state transaction when using the useState as a state variable to fetch data. So let's see how it looks like when we implement this same example with the useReducer hook. This is off now. In the next lecture, we are going to see how to implement this example with the useReducer. See you in the next lecture. In the previous lecture, we saw how to fetch data with the effect hook using the useState hook to manage the state transaction. So, in this example, we are going to see how to fetch data with the useEffect hook by implementing the useReducer hook to maintain and manage the state transaction. Within this package, we are going to create a new component called useReducer data fetch. Generate the functional component. Let's quickly import the use reducer and the use effect. So right at the top level, use reducer, comma, use effect. And as well, we have to import Axios from Axios. Let's declare the initial state as property of a single object. Let me show you how to do that quickly. Const initial state equal set it to an empty object. And right within the object, we are going to group the entire state that we are going to have in the application right within. We are going to have loading set it to true. Just as we did in the previous lecture. The error set it to an empty string and the post to an empty object. So these are the transitions that we need in this application. And with this, we have been able to group the entire state within an object. And that's extremely cool. Let's quickly define the reducer function. So having done this, come here, we have to invoke the use reducer. So within the use reducer, we are going to take in the reducer and the initial state as a parameter. So this is the initial state that we have at the top over here. 
And for the reducer, we also have to define the reducer. I'm going to do const reducer equal set it to arrow function. And the reducer takes in two parameter. First is the state and then second is the action. Now we have two state transition to be implemented. First is when the request is successful and second is when the request fails. Let me show you quickly. Go back to the use state data fetch. This is going to be the first state transition and this is the second state transition. Let's see how to implement this quickly. So right within the reducer function, we are going to have a switch and the switch expression is going to be action dot type. So case one is going to be data fetch success. Data underscore fetch underscore success. So if everything is fine, now we are going to return loading just like we did in the previous lecture. The post, we are going to have the action dot payload comma and then the error is going to be an empty string and as well the second case is when the request fails so here we are going to have case data underscore fetch underscore error so when an error occurs we are going to return same thing here like this so right within the return, we are going to set loading to false. The post is going to be set to an empty object. And then the error something went wrong. And of course, we have to specify the default case, which will return the state. Let's quickly format the code for proper indentation. Having done this, come here. So for the use reducer hook, it returns a pair of value, which is the current state and the dispatch method. Const state comma dispatch, and then assign it like this. And now we are going to make the API call. And of course that should be done within the effect hook. Let's quickly invoke the use effect. We just have to copy from the previous lecture. Head on to use state data fetch. And then I'm going to copy from lines 9 to lines 21. Copy. Come here. Right within the function. We have to paste. Let's make the necessary changes. So we just have to replace the use state occurrences. Right within the promise block. We are going to highlight from lines 35 to 37. Wipe it off. So now when the fetching is successful, we have to dispatch the action. Dispatch, right within the dispatch method, we are gonna take in an object. And then we have to specify the action type. And the type of the action to be dispatched when the fetch is successful is data underscore fetch underscore success. Let me show you at the top. Here is it. Highlight and then copy. Come here. Paste it within the string. When we dispatch the data fetch success, we have to specify the payload. And the payload is going to be response.data. Let me explain to you what the payload is in a GV. The payload is the data that your reducer will use to update the state. So we are going to grab a new data and then that will be used to update the initial state. And of course, the initial state is just an empty object. And here is it. So right within the card block, we have to dispatch the error action. Dispatch. Right within the dispatch method, we have to specify the type of the action. The type of this action is going to be data underscore fetch underscore error. Come here and paste. 
It's as simple as that. So we do not have to specify the payload over here simply because we have already specified the error message. And here is the error message. Let's quickly display the data on the browser. So we just have to copy the entire JSS of the previous example and append state to all the variable names simply because they are all part of the state object. So right within the use state data fetch, we just have to copy the body like this. Highlight and copy. Come here, paste it like this. Let's quickly format for proper indentation. Perfect. What I'm going to do now is to append states to all the variables. State dot is loading. And here we are going to do state dot post dot body. Quickly render this in the app component and let's see what we have on the browser. Use reducer data fetch from component slash all of these levels of directory that you have to target. And come here, place a comment on this. Use reducer data fetch. Save and move on to the browser. Let's see the expected outcome. Oops, something went wrong. All right, guys. You could remember that in the previous lecture, we altered the URL. So we have to go back to JSON placeholder to copy the appropriate URL. And here is it. Copy, come here, and paste. And I think it is also good to make the correction here as well. All right, so that you don't run into trouble in the future when you want to refresh my code. Okay, over here, save, and let's see the expected result. And they are these. Beautiful. Everything is working perfectly fine as expected. Now, the difference between this example and what we did in the previous lecture is that we were able to group the related state together. Let me show you at the top. Over here like this. Okay. And also the state transition are also grouped together. Now the argument is this. If the use reducer and the use state hook are both used for state management, when will it be preferable to use the use reducer over the use state hook? So quickly, let's discuss that in the next lecture. This is all for now and See you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In this lecture, we are going to study another important hook, which is the use callback. However, it is so important to understand performance optimization before we proceed with use callback. And hence, that is clear to you, we can now discuss what a use callback is, why and when you should use it. And here I have already built a simple counter application. So quickly, let me walk you through it. Let's head on to the app component. And over here we have rendered a component called main component. And here is it. So right within the main component, we have two different components which is reused with different properties to show different informations. And the first is the counter component. This counter component over here is responsible to display the current number of teachers. The button component is responsible to increment the teacher. And then here we reused the counter component to show the number of students and then also we reused the button component to increment student. And all of this function over here is defined at the top. Here we have the increment teachers function, the increment student, and then we have the necessary state variables at the top. So right within this function, we are incrementing teachers by 5. And here we are incrementing students by 10. Alright, so all of this will happen when the button is clicked. 
So come back here. When you observe this component, you will realize that we are passing test as probs and as well the current state of the teacher. And right within the button component, we are taking the handle click as props and then we pass in the increment teachers function as it value. And this function is defined at the top. Of course, I've shown you already. And same thing here. We are taking in test and count as props and then we pass in the value of the current student. And right within this button, we pass in the handle click as props and we are taking in the increment student as it value, which is the props value. Quickly head on to the button component. So right within the button component, we destructured handle click and children. And here we implemented a button and on click of this button, we are taking in this props, which is the handle click that has got the value of the increment teacher and the increment student function. And over here, we are passing in the children as an inner HTML. So this is going to show the test in between the button. Let me show you quickly in the main component. So the inner HTML over here, this guy, increment student and increment teacher. This will be displayed because of the props.children. Of course, you should know that by now. And quickly, let's move on to the counter component. Right within the counter component, we destructured test and count. And over here, we are taking in test and count. The count will display the current value of the teachers and the students. To wrap it up, we created a new directory called use callback practice. And here is it. So right within this directory, we created all of these components. And then we rendered the main component in the app.js. And for sure, the button component and the count component is nested within the main component. And at the top, we imported them. It's as simple as that. Haven't understood the application? Let's quickly proceed with the business of the day. Close it down. So the purpose of this example is to focus on performance optimization. And to measure the performance, we have some log statement over here. Let me show you. Can you see? So this will help show the component that is being rendered. And over here also, we have some log statement. So right within the terminal, we have to run the application. Perfect. This is exactly what we are expecting. So when I click on increment teachers, teachers will be incremented by five. Do you see? And when I click on increment student, students will be incremented by 10. Everything seems to be working perfectly fine, but let's quickly check out the console and see what happens. All right, so for a start, we just have to clear the console again so that it appears clear enough. Now, I want to hit on the increment teachers button. When I click on the increment teachers, you are going to see rendering teachers, rendering button increment teachers. And over here, you are going to see rendering students and rendering button increment students. When I click on the increment student, you are going to see exactly the same log statement. Rendering teachers, rendering button increment teachers, rendering students and rendering button increment student. So here exactly is where the problem lies. Because if we click on the increment teachers, there is no need to re-render the increment student component. But in this case, when we increment teachers, the student components will be re-rendered. And as well, when we increment students, the teacher's components will be re-rendered. And this will cause some performance issues in your application. So just imagine we have over 100 components over here. And by updating a single component, the rest of the 99 components will be re-rendered. Friends, that won't be nice at all because you will begin to experience some performance issue. And therefore, to optimize performance, 
we have to precisely render only the component that needs to be re-rendered when its state or props changes. And that will be done with React.memo. React.memo is a fantastic tool for memoizing functional components. And when applied correctly, it prevents a functional component not to re-render if the props or state did not change. Sounds good? Beautiful. All right, so you can think of memoization as a way of counting a value such that it does not need to be recalculated when the state or props did not change. So let's quickly optimize this application with react.memo. VS Code. And quickly, let's head on to the main component. All right, so to optimize the application, what we are going to do is quite simple. So what I'm going to do right now is to highlight this guy, export default, and then cut. Come here, paste it, and then we are going to do react.memo. And now we have to pass in the component. It's as simple as that. So what I'm going to do right now is to highlight and copy. Let's go to the bolting component. Come here, paste. We have to change the component to bolting component. And over here, let's remove the export default. Do the same in the counter component. Remove the export default. Come here, paste. So here we have to pass in the component of concern, which is the counter component. It's as simple as that. Save, and let's check out the browser. Refresh. On the first render, you will see all the components right here on the console. Rendering teachers, rendering button increment teachers, rendering student, and then rendering button increment student. Let's clear the console. So now let's give it a try by clicking the increment teacher. Can you see? Now we have rendering teachers, rendering button increment teachers, and then rendering button increment student. For now, we are able to optimize the application just a little bit. Okay, because here we still have the rendering button increment student right on the console, which is not very good. So when we hit on increment student, you are going to see rendering button increment teachers, rendering student, and then rendering button increment student. So the intention of this lecture is to prevent unnecessary render. Okay, so because when you click on the student button, the teacher's related components should not be re-rendered. Okay, and as well, when you click on the teachers, the student related components should not be re-rendered. And now this will throw another challenge. Because we are not changing the state of the student component, but here it is being re-rendered. Okay, let me quickly show you again. When I click on increment teachers, you see that rendering button increment student. We are not changing the state of the student component, so we do not want it to be re-rendered. But here on the console, you can see that the student component button is being re-rendered. So when you clear the console and do the same to increment student, you will see that the teacher related component, which is the button component of the teacher, is being re-rendered as well. So this is referred to as unnecessary renders. Let me quickly explain to you what happens under the hood. Head on to the main component. So over here, we have the counter component and it accepts teacher as props. The button component accepts the increment teacher as its props value, which is the function that is defined at the top. Here is it. So this simply means that when the state of the teacher gets updated, the counter component of the teacher and the button component of the teacher will be re-rendered. But the problem now is that even the student button is being re-rendered, though the counter component for the student do not re-render. Okay, so this happens simply because when you call the increment teacher function, 
A new increment student function is created each time the parent component re-renders. And for sure, when working with function, we must put reference equality into consideration. So even if these two functions behave exactly the same, that does not mean that they are equal to each other. Therefore, the function before the re-render is different from the function after re-render. So simply because we pass the function as props, React.memo will quickly realize that the props has changed, and then it won't be able to avoid the re-render. Sounds tricky, right? Let me break it down. When you increment teachers, a new increment student function will be created which will cause the increment student button to re-render. And when you increment students, a new increment teacher function will be created, which also will cause the increment teacher function to re-render. And now the question is, how do we inform React not to create a new increment student function when we update the teachers? Alright, so here exactly is where use callback comes in. So what is the use callback hooks? The use callback returns a memoized version of the callback function that only changes if one of the dependencies has changed. So in simplicity, the use callback hook is used when you have a component in which a child is rendering repeatedly without the need for it. Alright, so to implement the use callback, several conditions must be satisfied. Condition 1 is that we must have a callback function. The second condition is that we must optimize the child component with react.memo. Let me show you. Here, we optimized the child component. And here, we also optimized the child component. The third condition is that we must check the reference equality. For the reference equality, we have to check if the functions are equal. So if the above condition is satisfied, we can then proceed to further optimize our application with the use callback hook. All right, so to implement the use callback hook, several steps are involved. Don't worry, the steps are indeed very simple. Scroll to the top. First, we have to import the use callback. And after that, Step number two is to invoke the use callback. And the use callback is a function that takes in a callback function as its first argument. So what I'm going to do right now is to copy this function like this, highlight, cut, come here and paste. And after that, we have to assign it to a variable like this. All right. Beautiful. So the second argument of the use callback is a dependency array. So what I'm going to do now is to specify a comma and then take in the dependency array. And this callback over here depends on the teacher's variable to get fire up. Come here, highlight and copy, paste it right within the dependency. So this function will get triggered only when the state of the teachers changes. It's as simple as that. So let's replicate the same thing for the student. Use callback. It accepts a callback function as its first argument. Copy this. Highlight and cut. Come here. Paste it. And then over here, we have to assign it to a variable. Like this. The second argument is a dependency array. This will get fired up when the state of the student changes. So we just have to specify student as a dependency array. So it simply means that it depends on the state of the student to get fired up. If the student state did not change, the function won't get called. It's as simple as that. So we have to assign it like this. Having done this, 
Let's quickly check it out on the browser. I'm going to refresh. Beautiful. So for the very first time when the application loads, the whole of the component will be rendered. Let's quickly refresh the console. So when you click on the increment teachers, on the console, you will realize that only the teachers related component is what is being re-rendered. Okay, so you are not going to get unnecessary re-renders like the student component anymore. And as well, when you increment the student, let's clear off the console and then increment student. You will realize that only the student related component is what is being re-rendered on the screen. And the proof is right on the console. So with this, we can say that the application is fully optimized. Can you see? So we no longer have some useless re-renders. This is extremely awesome and I love it. Friends, this is all for now and see you in the next lecture. Stay focused and always take care. In the previous lecture, we discussed the use callback hook, which focuses on performance optimization. So, in this lecture, we are going to discuss the use memo hooks, which also focus on performance optimization. The React use memo hook returns a memoized value. And I want you to think of memoization as catching a value so that it does not need to be recalculated. Take note, the use memo hook only runs when one of its dependencies updates. And that improves performance. So, to understand how it works, we are going to exemplify it. Let's quickly create a new package called use memo practice. Right within the component, new folder. Within the use memo practice, let's create a new component. My memo counter dot js. Quickly generate the functional component. And then let's declare the necessary state variables and its setter function to be used. And for sure, you have to import the use state hook. And I'm going to do counter A. So what I just have to do here is to use the car marquees, which is for the setter function. And the initial state is going to be zero. Highlight, duplicate it. And then I'm going to highlight the big letter A. Command D to select the occurrences. Wipe it off. Change it to B. So we have the counter A and counter B state variables. It's as simple as that. And over here, we are going to define a function to increment counter A by 1 and then also increment counter B by 2. Const increment A equal Set it to our function. And then I'm going to do set counter A in brackets. We are going to take in the new update. Counter A plus one. Just simple as that. Highlight. Duplicate it. Just have to select the occurrences of A like this. Change it to B. And over here, we just have to do counter B plus one. So we want to exemplify the use memo with a simple counter application. Let's quickly have something rendered on the screen. Here we're going to have a P tag. Within the P tag, I'm going to do counter A is, of course, you should know this by now. And here we want to implement a button to increment counter A. On click of this button, we are going to call the function increment A. That's simple as that. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to have another div. 
highlight this guy from lines 18 to 19 move it into this new div that we created so let me quickly format the code perfect so i'm going to highlight from lines 15 to 18 duplicate here we are going to do b b and b and b oh my god i should have just selected the occurrences and do it once when you save the application head on to the app.js and let's have it rendered this place is quite messy but we have to manage it like that import my memo counter from you already know come down highlight place a comment on it check it out on the browser beautiful everything is working perfectly fine so let's try it on a good b good everything working perfectly fine so here exactly is where the fun begins now let's improve the application so let's say we want to display even when the number is even and then odd when the number is odd let's quickly improve it come here we are going to have another function const even number set it to our function so this guy is going to take in results and over here i'm going to do result equal counter a modulus 2 equals 0 that's simple as that and then we have to return whatever the result is perfect having done this let's quickly display it on the ui so right within the p tag of counter a we have to place some condition over here so counter a is whatever the state value is and then if it is even or odd so we have to specify if the number is odd or even and um i'm gonna do um it is so here first we have to call the function even and after that we have to put a check on it if the number is even then we are going to say even and else we're going to say odd that's simple as that save the application and check it out on the browser reload okay so let's increment a can you see it says counter is one and it is odd increment again it says counter a is two and it is even just like that <laughs> all right one more thing we want to do that is extremely important is that we are going to try to induce slowness into the function so let's assume we want this function to be executed within some few seconds all right so we want some delay in execution so for that we have to induce some slowness into the function let's quickly do that head on to vs code and right here i'm going to do let i equal zero and then while i is less than we are going to have zero nine times exactly and then we have to increment i by one having done this we have induced slowness into this function so this will slow down the calculation in two seconds head on to the browser let's reload now when i click on counter a can you see it takes some few seconds for counter a to get incremented try it again do you see so here exactly is where the issue lies so the slowness was induced on counter a but now when i click on counter b do you see we still experience the same slowness let me try it again do you see that it takes some few seconds for counter b to get calculated and have the result displayed on the screen but look that is not what we want here 
All we want is to induce slowness on counter A and not on counter B. So we don't want this to affect counter B. So what happens over here is that whenever the state gets updated, the component will re-render. And when the component re-renders, the function even number is invoked for the second time. And for sure, the function is very slow. And hence, it will slow down the whole process and UI update. We don't want that to happen to the application. So the solution to this problem is to prevent unnecessary value from being recalculated. And in this case, we are going to inform React not to perform this computation when we are changing the value of counter B. It's as simple as that. So there is no need to calculate and show whether number is odd or even when dealing with counter B. Because that exactly is what the application seems to be doing right now. Go back. When you click on counter A, it takes some few seconds to calculate and show if the number is even or odd. Counter B is not interested to see if the number is odd or even. But still, when you increment counter B, it takes some few seconds to get calculated. Simply because the slowness we induced on this guy over here is affecting this guy. And therefore, we have to prevent unnecessary calculations. And to prevent this unnecessary calculation, we have to make use of the use memo. Go back to VS Code. So to implement the use memo hook, first, it has to be imported, just like other hooks as well. The use memo hook is a function. We have to invoke it. So come right here. I'm going to do use memo. The use memo will take in the return function, which value needs to be couched as its first argument. And in this case, the function to calculate either the number is even or odd. So here I'm just going to copy from here like this, highlight, cut, come here, and paste it as the use memo first argument. So the second argument is a dependency array, comma, take it an empty array. And for this function to get fire up, it has to depend on counter A. And I'm going to do counter A, just like this. And after that, highlight this guy, cut, come here, assign it like this. So having done this, the even number is no longer a function call because it now stores a value. So go back to the UI and remove the parentheses. We have to remove this guy. Save the application and check out the browser. Reload. All right. Let's give it a try by clicking the increment A. Can you see? It takes some few seconds for counter A to get incremented. Take a look. So let's try it on B. Do you see? Counter B gets incremented without wasting any time. Now, the slowness we induced on counter A is working perfectly fine only on counter A. And this time around, it doesn't affect counter B. Simply because we have implemented the use memo hook to optimize the application. And in this case, we are having the slowness being induced on the appropriate counter. So, Whenever counter A changes, React will recompute the value and disregard the card value, which simply implies it is not going to use the card value anymore. So since the value never changed for counter A, there is no need to recompute the odd or even value. And then React will use the card value from the previous render. So hence counter B will not be affected by the slowness that we induced. And now the question is, what is the difference between the use callback and the use memo? Use callback is used to catch a function, whereas the use memo is used to catch the result of an invoked function. It's as simple as that.
Or you can say that the use callback is used to catch a callback function. This is all for now and see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, we are going to study the useRef hook. The useRef hook is used to access a DOM element directly within the functional component. And it can also be used to store a mutable value that does not cause a re-render when it is updated. So, in addition, useRef hook allows you to persist value between renders. Let's go ahead to exemplify it. So, the intention of this example is to focus the cursor right in the input field when the page loads. Take for example, you are creating a registration form. We want to focus the cursor right in the first input field when the page loads. So quickly create a new package called useRef practice. And I hope you love the way I'm organizing the lectures. Within the useRef practice, let's create a new component called focus input. Right within the UI, let's create an input field. The type equal test. Close it up with the soft closing tag. Quickly render this component in the app JS. Import focus input from this guy. And here we have to render focus input. Let's see what happens on the browser. And here is the input field. Let me zoom up a little bit. Perfect. Back to VS Code. Focus Input Component. The next in line is to implement component did mount functionality. First, we have to import the use effect. Let's quickly invoke it right here. It takes in an arrow function as its first argument, and as well, it takes in a dependency array. But in this case, we are going to leave it empty because we want the effect to get fired up once. So there's no need to specify a dependency variable. Okay? So let's proceed with the use ref. At the top, we have to import the use ref. Let's call it right here. Don't worry, you will definitely get the gist. Just follow along. And of course, we want it to take now. And now, let's assign it to a variable called imputRev. Haven't created the ref? The next in line is to make use of it. And then we have to make use of it right within the input tag. And the way we can use it is to specify the ref attribute we have to call the variable input ref. It's as simple as that. So finally, we have to invoke the focus function on the input element right in the use effect. So right here, let's invoke the focus function. And I'm going to do input ref dot current dot focus. Just like this. So with this, React is setting the ref current property to the corresponding DOM node. Let's see what happens on the browser. Can you see? So when the component mounts, the mouse will focus on the input field. And this implementation is very helpful when you are creating a registration form and you want the first input field on the registration form to be focused on when the page load. You can see it clearly. Do you see the cursor right inside the input field? But when we take off the ref, so let's place a comment on this. Can you see? Nothing is found in the input field. So the input field do not have focus. But when you implement the ref on the browser, 
Take a look. Reload. Can you see? The input field is focused on. So this exactly is what the user of can help you achieve. To further explain useref hook, let's quickly set up an example of a clock timer application. So right within the useref practice, let's quickly create a new component called timer. Right click, new file. Timer.js. Generate the functional component. The intention of this lecture is to implement an interval timer that takes every seconds to display the value on the browser. To do that, first, we have to declare the variable to hold the interval value. So right at the top, of course, by now, you should know how to do this. And here, we are going to declare the state variable. And we're going to call it timer. So we just have to make it a comma case over here. And the initial state is going to be zero. Let's quickly display the value of the timer right within the JSS. I'm going to use the h2 tag. And then here I'm going to do timer is the new value of the timer. Save. Let's quickly render it in the app component. And here we have to import timer from component slash useref practice slash timer. And right below, let's render it over here. When you save the application, check out the browser. You see that timer is the initial state or the initial value of the timer. Go back to VS Code and let's quickly implement the timer. To set up the timer, we have to implement it right within the effect hook. So at the top, we have to import the effect hook. Come here. The effect hook is a function and then we have to invoke it. So this function takes in an arrow function as its first parameter. And as well, the second parameter is a dependency array. And in this case, we are going to have an empty dependency array. So right within the effect is where the transformation takes place. We are going to have const interval equal set interval. And again, we have to take in an arrow function. So right within this function, we have to update the timer. And we do that by calling the setter function for the timer. And right within, we are going to take in the previous timer. And previous timer plus one. That's simple as that. And we want this to be displayed on the browser every second. So right here, we are going to place a comma here and then induce it over here. Having done this, we have to implement a return function to clear the interval. Return. And here I'm going to do clear interval. We have to pass in interval. When you save and check out the browser, can you see? The major challenge we have in this lecture is to clear off the timer when the button is clicked. So let's quickly implement a button to carry out that functionality. We have to specify the on click. So on click of this button, we want to clear off the timer. All right, let's do that and see how it goes. We're going to call the clear interval and then passing interval. And here within the inner test, I'm going to do clear timer. When you save and check out the browser, do you see? It says interval is not defined. You know why? Go back to VS Code and let me show you. 
It is simply because the variable interval is locally scoped only to the effect hook. So when you do this, the interval can only be cleared right within the effect hook. We want to clear the interval when the button is clicked. And immediately we implemented the button, look what happens. It says the variable interval of which we passed in over here is not defined. But look, we defined it over here at line 7. So this simply means that this interval can only be seen right within the effect hook. To solve this problem, we have to make use of useRef hooks. Take note, useRef can also be used to store a mutable value that does not cause a re-render when updated. And again, the useRef is a function, so we have to invoke it as usual. But first, it has to be imported at the top. And here at the top, we are going to invoke the useRef. And now we are going to do const ref interval. Assign it like this. So the next in line is to replace all the occurrences of interval with ref dot current. Come here. We have to wipe off this variable. And then I'm going to do ref interval dot current. It's as simple as that. And remember that we have to replace all the occurrences of interval. And here we have one over here that is passed in to the clear interval method. Replace it like this. And here we have another one. When you save the application, let's check out the browser. Let's give it a try by clicking the clear timer button. Take a look. Now we have succeeded in clearing the timer. So when we click on this button, the interval will be cleared and then the timer will stop. So this is another problem that the useRef solves.